OK, so last time we saw that a raised cosine in frequency, that the pulse associated with that in time has this nice no inner symbol interference property, no ISI property, where the zero crossings of all the adjacent pulses happen right when your, your pulse happens, the current pulse happens. Uh, but let me take a little detour and talk about why that's not actually what we transmit. And this detour will make sense in a, in a minute, but let me just say, the, the, let me describe the concept of a matched filter. So this comes from radar. So imagine you send a funny, a funny radar pulse that looks, it looks kind of like, like this, and I'm just gonna draw some random, random looking pulse. Imagine you're transmitting that as a function of time, and it bounces off some very distant object and you get a very weak reflection back. And you wanna know, I wanna take my reflection that I get back and pass it through some sort of filter. So imagine it's noisy and I'm gonna really underestimate the amount of noise that you would get in a real system. But you know, you sort of get a noisy version of this, of this pulse. And I wanna know what filter should I pass this through to maximize the response for the, uh, for the actual pulse as compared to the response for random noise. And, and the answer turns out to be that I should pass it through a filter with, with uh, whose shape is, is the same as the pulse. So one way of thinking about it is I, can, I should correlate this incoming noisy signal with a perfect computational reconstruction of what I expect that to be. And if I were to multiply these two things together, to multiply these two things together, I would get something that's all positive. So I have to draw that over here. So I get some noisy, noisy noise, or actually, well, I guess the perfect, re, the perfect, uh, perfect reconstruction, I, the way I drew it should be zero here. And then maybe I'll get a, a noisy, really high positive lo lobe. And then when they both go negative, I multiply them together and that actually gives me something positive. And then I have this sort of positive square shape thing, which is also positive. And what I do is I add all these things together and I get a very big, very positive number. And that's the correlation of what I'm getting in with the original perfect mathematical reconstruction with no shift. And I don't know what the shift is. So I imagine having to correlate this, uh, this pulse with my noisy reconstruction at all kinds of different shifts. And as, I, as I'm approaching it, you can imagine that there's just as much positive product as negative product, and these things tend to kind of average out. And so unless I'm pretty close to the right timing offset, I'll get pretty low correlation. And then right when I'm on the right offset, I'll get a, you know, my, multi, my uh, products will all be positive with, with some noise and I'll get a very high correlation. And then as I shift off of it, I'll get a pretty low correlation. And this concept of taking what a, a noisy version of what I'm getting back and correlating it against a copy of what I've sent, that's called a matched filter. And this is optimal if all you have is additive white Gaussian noise. So just sort of, you know, the kind of noise you would get from thermal, uh, thermal sources or just a superposition of all kinds of other random stuff gives you uh, a spectrum of noise that, that's flat, whose distribution, if I were to ask at any point, what is the probability that I'm getting uh, any value off of, off of zero would, would be Gaussian. So uh, this is the concept of a matched filter, that the best filter to correlate your signal against is a copy of what you think the signal should be. So given that, let's, let's pause and let's go back and talk about the raised cosine pulse. So we wanted the raised cosine pulse because it, was, it had no inner symbol interference. That was the, the, the shape that was this nice compromise. We, we had a, a little bit of extra bandwidth, but not too much. And we had some nice, nice shapes in, in time and it's quite contained in, in frequency. And if that's what we want, we have three options. So option one would be to, 
to transmit, let me write it this way, to transmit some other pulse, like a square rectangular pulse or even really pulsy pulses and, and uh, apply, apply the raised cosine filter, filter um, at the receiver. And this is not good because you're transmitting either bursts or, or squares. Maybe I'll draw the squares in a different color. Uh, squares like this. And we are back to the same problem of taking up a huge amount of bandwidth. So this is obviously a, a bad choice. So maybe I'll call that option number one. Option number two would be to transmit, transmit the raised cosine pulse. But, but then what do we do at the receiver? Well, okay, so the receiver, we would have to apply some sort of filter. We wanna filter out all the noise from adjacent channels or anything that's out of band or any, any noise that, that's not in, in the spectral region we care about. So, so apply, apply some, some other filter, filter at the receiver. The problem is that any filter we apply at the receiver is probably going to shape the the incoming pulse a little bit, and we'll no longer have this nice property where we have this no inner symbol interference. And so, option number three, which is what what we choose, is that we transmit what are called the square root raised cosine pulses, and this has a uh, a frequency response that's just the square root of the one that I drew. And the pulses in time look very similar. And then, and then at the receiver, we apply, apply a matched root raised cosine filter. So this has all the good properties of matched filters where we're transmitting a pulse that, that sort of has, you know, looks something like this. That's not exactly what I drew before because it's spectrum is the square root of the spectrum that I drew before, but it, it's gonna look pretty similar. And I pass it through a matched filter. So every pulse gets correlated against, uh, well, the superposition of incoming pulses get correlated against a perfect, Mathematical or uh, I don't know simulation generation of of this of this pulse, and what I get out then uh, after this process is a uh, is no no inner symbol interference. So I've applied I've applied one filter at the transmitter to output these pulses, and I apply another filter at the receiver to correlate against them. So just to be clear, these for people who have done signal processing stuff, these filters have an impulse response that is the shape that I've been drawing. And so if I put impulses into the filter, I will get out a sequence of these shapes scaled by what I, the impulses I put in and, and shifted accordingly. And the, the second filter has the same impulse response, but that's exactly what we want in the match filter. We want to correlate against a copy of this. And so that's, that's what we do uh, in, in a real system. We, we transmit a slightly modified version so that when we receive it, we can filter again, uh, which is the same as correlating against a known good copy. And the double filtered root, root raised cosine, root raised cosine, the net effect is to give us a raised cosine filter. So let me, Play the. Let me show you the simulation again. Give me radio, and that's exactly what we're doing here. So this first root raised cosine filter is what comes out of the transmitter, or well, what what gets fed into the transmitter. Here we can imagine this is the uh, oops, this little arrow here is the the whole transmitting SDR and receiving SDR and anything else we might do to it, and the second root raised cosine filter is applied at the receiver. So that's why I was focused on this eye diagram on the right, where after we pass it through two filters, 
we recover this nice no inner symbol interference property for any value of alpha, where at the right samples, we, we don't have any uh, uh, variation. Now, if you forget the second filter, then you're not going to have this nice property, this nice no inner symbol interference property. Yeah, you're always going to have some, some variation. So these, uh, it'll turn out that these root raised cosine filters are built into some other GNU radio blocks. But I want to explain what's going on so that when you're looking at things, uh, they, they're going to make sense in context. And here I plotted the spectrum of the raised cosine pulses. So having passed through two root raised cosine filters and the green, I, I've just plotted the spectrum as I passed through one. But the spectra of the two don't look that different for any, any reasonable value of alpha. So the, spec, the spectrum of the thing that I'm transmitting is a little bit wider. So you can see the green is a little bit wider than the proper raised cosine pulse that I'm going to end up filtering. But it's, it's not much wider, and it still is going to cut off. It's still going to go to 0 uh, at the same place. So it, it doesn't extend beyond. It just has a little bit more power in the intermediate stages. All right, so that's what we're going to do, because we're actually going to transmit these pulses and receive them. That's the, the, next, the next, uh, next topic.